This is Interviews with Technical People with John Robertson and James Have You, a podcast where we interview technical people in STEM fields to discuss the past, present, and future from their perspective. And uh, today we're joined by Dr. Gordon Patterson. Uh, Gordon's a history professor at the Florida Institute of Technology and a historian specializing in the history of mosquito disease control, especially in Florida. Uh, Dr. Patterson, welcome to the show. Hey, fellas, it's good talking to you. Thanks for having me on and describing me as a technical person. Historians are usually described in somewhat other terms than technical, like uh, an infestation of uh, something that needs to be pushed away. We'll, we'll get into some of that later. <laughs> there is one thing that I'd love to talk about right off the bat, because it's, it's I think, worthy of note. So you are a historian, but you... You know, a historian at a topic that I think a lot of people would find relevant. But even beyond that, you're a historian at a tech school, which is a unique calling, I would presume. So can we go into a little bit? So what do you currently do? What's your current position, Dr. Patterson? And a little bit for how'd you get there? Well, I've, this this coming September, on the 19th of September, will be my 40th year at Florida Institute of Technology. And it's been a, an extraordinarily wonderful place to be. Uh, and my interests have uh, always been on the boundary uh, between different disciplines. And oftentimes people think of historians as those that are the chroniclers of battles and military engagements and political campaigns, but history is much, much more important than that. And what really defines, in my mind, the modern epoch is the emergence of our conversation with the natural world through the lens of science and technology. And that meant for me 40 years ago, I, I was teaching in, I, I'd left the country in 1973, and I was I, I was in Europe for eight years, and I just gotten a promotion, and I came back to the states uh, for six weeks in the summer of 1981. And years before, I'd been in New York and put my name into the hamper of at the American Historical Association's annual meeting, and I was out in San Francisco, and I got a call uh, from this school in Florida saying, we'd like to interview you. We've got uh, an interest uh, because of a grant from the National Endowment of the Humanities to set up a program for the curriculum for engineers and science majors. We need a historian of science. And would you come for an interview? Well, my mother-in-law happened to live on Sanibel, the island on the Gulf Coast. So I was going to be in Florida before flying back. And I came and uh, I walked through the botanical cart. And I thought, gosh, if engineers keep, you know, a garden like this, then maybe maybe these engineers can teach me a lot of things. And so I um, – And it's worth noting that a few years ago that that garden was named after your wife and yourself. Uh, I, it was a great honor. You're right. It was. Yeah. That, 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 and, and I became – very much interested. The founding president of the university was a man named Jerry Cooper, and um, Cooper was a very improbable figure. I mean, he he was a physicist. Uh, uh, he'd been in what was the ancestor of the CIA, the OSS, and gone into Burma and the China Burma Theater in World War II, and came to came to Florida as part of the missile test project through the help of a friend named Jim Stoms. Jim Stoms was the man who hired me. He was the dean. Uh, and there was this can-do sensibility. The university is much more professional today and there are boundaries and things. And uh, At that time, uh, Professor Stoms and uh, Dr. Cooper, uh, you know, were very much individuals who said, we'll try this guy out, see what he can do. And ever since then, I've been running. Uh, now, I'll admit sometimes when I would see Cooper, I would duck behind a car because he'd have some zany idea. And once we were out putting electric blankets around a, a palm tree because a cold snap was going to come through. So 
in some sense, I've answered your question in an oblique manner by telling you Florida Institute of Technology is a place that is always one that gives you an opportunity to think and to do different things. And for me, uh, the interaction with engineers and scientists has been always uh, something that's generated uh, uh, new interest and new questions. So it's been a good place for me. One thing I think uh, is worth pointing out to the listeners is uh, Dr. Patterson is the historian of FIT and wrote the book on the history of FIT quite literally. So and I'm working on In fact, I was in a meeting yesterday about a second book because that, that book was done in 2000 and a lot's happened in the last 20 years. And also I wanted to um, take a somewhat more irreverent uh, uh, approach to the history of the university because a lot of zany things have happened here. And uh, uh, part of our institutional memory is just the craziness of uh, uh, some of the students and faculty members, and uh, we should not let that fall into the dustbin of history. We, we've had the professor that John had the most classes with on this podcast already, Hakeem Olashe. Uh, the most college classes I ever had was with Dr. Patterson. And I how, not... how is the uh, counseling going after that? I mean, have, have the therapist uh, helped you in <laughs> any way? Enough years have passed that I can sleep at night now. Good. Um, <laughs> I say, I, I didn't have the greatest sleep schedule, but I don't believe I ever fell asleep in your classes. And that enthusiasm uh, certainly helped to get through it. And I remember there was one class I took. It was, I wanted to take the history of science with you so badly, and it never fit in my schedule, but I was able to take an environmental history class. And it was an elective. It might've been a one-time thing. I'm not sure, but it, it talked about, you know, just, just the world we lived in and so much that, you know, we understood, I understood on a technical level and dealing with the earth and the environment. And I always found that for a humanities class, which I wasn't a big fan of most of those, uh, yours kept me very engaged and the whole class was engaged the whole time. And, uh, yeah, I think that enthusiasm, uh, really, really did something for your students. So I, I appreciated well, I, it. Well, thank you, James. I, I, I had a young co-ed a little while ago come up to me before COVID and say, oh, Professor Patterson, you're so mid-20th century. And I said, you got that right. You're looking at it to, you know, dip me in amber because the mid-20th century is going to go away. Uh, but, uh, and that, and, this dialogue, students are, you know, in my judgment, it's it's very interesting to watch. On the one hand, my students today in 2021 are extraordinarily streetwise and savvy. And yet on the other, there is a naivete and innocence. And it's, it's almost like something held very taut. And, and, and there is a middle. And, and trying in some ways to show them. I, I say to my students, I'll, I'll make a point. And I, obviously, I'm, I talk, try to talk about the subject that I'm teaching. But, you know, I will say just as an aside, in my 49 years of marriage, and I'll say that because I want my students to know that it's possible for individuals to make commitments that endure over time, that you can, and, and commitments, certainly a marriage is a most fundamental and uh, commitment in my life, but also commitments to your profession, to the ethical standards of your profession. And that profession does come from that word, which means to vocalize, to profess, to state that this is what I am. This is what I do. And one of the challenges that we face, and, 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 and I would offer as criticism of older people is, you know, you'll hear someone say, I haven't decided in there in their 50s or 60s or 40s. I've decided what I'm going to do when I grow up. It's, it's terribly demoralizing. And, and, and at certain points, you, you, you make a decision. 
I could be an industrial engineer. I could be an electrical engineer. I could be a historian. I could go to law school. And you choose a path. And part of the responsibility of a professor is to help, in my mind, people to see that you make commitments along the way. You chose a major. Uh, and, and you could have gone a different path. But like the Robert Frost poem, mm. you've chosen this path. And, and you can wonder later about what might have been. Uh, but I, 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 I think it's important for my students to get from me more than just the syllabus. Um, but that they get some confidence that, you know, there, 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 there are monsters and perils out there. But I think we read, uh, James, in, in, in Civ 1, we read uh, uh, Cavity's poem uh, uh, on uh, Odysseus, in which it begins, I paraphrase, don't blame uh, Polymephus, don't blame the sirens. Uh, yeah. They gave you the journey. Ithaca, mm. when you return to it, may be a rocky place, but it gave you the desire that you pursue. And in that sense, you know, we're all on a journey together. And Odysseus, you know, I when I I used to, I haven't taught Civ one in five or six years because I've been teaching other things, the Asian civilization. But I used to reread the Odyssey every summer, and uh, I I watched myself change. I used to identify with Telemachus, the the son, and then with Odysseus, and now I identify with Laertes, the old right. man who's out, you know taking care of his peach trees and olive trees. And, and in some respects, isn't that how all of us go? That we, if, if you live your life long enough, you, you will go through life and see yourself in different roles. You know, I can go on about this. I, Americans are peculiar creatures in that if you want to get someone irritated, if you say to them, you've changed, and people immediately become, oh, I haven't changed. You know, my answer always, of course I've changed. <laughs> of course I have. If I hadn't, I'd be a rock. Uh, and even rocks change over significant periods of time. You know, the process of life is change. And that's what history is about, change. You know. So if things never change, you wouldn't have a whole lot to talk about in history class. So there's another topic that I wanted to squeeze in. Because I wanted to take advantage for the listeners that we happen to be talking to one of the world's experts in the history of mosquito control. Now, Dr. Patterson, how does one get into that to begin with? And where has that where has that led you? A blessing, a blessing. You know, other people look at mosquitoes. They've given me a professional career. Uh, you know, so. And now I, I have to ha I have to have one note here for, the, for anyone who knows my wife, Ellie. I think she hates mosquitoes with a passion that is, is uh, maybe uncommon, but there are people out there, Dr. Patterson, who really just want all mosquitoes to just go away. Forever. Well, you should, t you should talk to your wife. Uh, in Finland in 1991, uh, uh, a Finn uh, started a mosquito swatting competition. Oh. Uh, and you might want to talk to your wife about a trip uh, uh, to Finland, she could enter into that competition and win a place for herself in the record books, uh, turn that uh, distaste for oh. six-legged blood-sucking pests into fame and notoriety. This, I, uh, it, it, we, I should just get the tickets now. <laughs> the only problem yes. with this contest, I was playing with it, <laughs> is that they set up an area and uh, you have a certain amount of time to swat mosquitoes, but uh, unfortunately, the spectators are also attractive to the mosquitoes. And so, <laughs> the, you know, mosquitoes say, oh, my gosh, this is the real, you know, brunch. Uh, and, and they spread out. So the numbers, uh, you know, you might enter uh, as an observer. Now, I was lucky. Uh, one, of, uh, one of my colleagues at the university, Professor Juanita Baker, she was in the psychology department. She had spent about 13 years in Lahore, Pakistan, and yes. uh, remarkable. She started the first bookmobile. And why was she in, La in Lahore? 
She was there because her husband, Richard Baker, uh, was uh, leading a malaria uh, project. And in 1982, uh, Dick Baker was brought back to the States uh, uh, and became the director of the Florida Medical Entomology Laboratory that's part of the University of Florida, which is one of the perhaps two or three laboratories on this planet that studies vector-borne diseases, uh, whatever. And they're about 25, world-class. I was, I had brunch, uh, coffee with a group of them yesterday morning, uh, entomologists, medical entomologists. And one night, uh, I was, we were in Vero, Joy and I, and having dinner with the Bakers, and Dick Baker walked out the car and said, you know, Gordon, somebody ought to write a history of mosquito control. Hmm. And then, you know, for a historian, the problem of when does the story begin is always, you know, you can always go for that. Hmm. But with mosquitoes, yeah. it's not until 1878 that, you know, in any insect borne disease appeared in any medical textbook. Really? And so the discovery, I mean, insects were problematic, I mean, they were, you know, pests. But the discovery that first it was Patrick uh, uh, Manson's discovery of philaresis, he discovered it in what's now Taiwan. And then in the 1890s, you have Ross with malaria. Carlos Finley in Cuba had speculated but unable to prove that yellow fever was a mosquito bar. The Reed Commission in 1900 demonstrates that. 1902, Barber and Graham demonstrate that dengue and suddenly, in terms of infectious diseases, the diseases that have killed more human beings than anything else on our planet is related to this six-legged blood-sucking creature. And so there's this explosion from a taxonomic perspective of people out there, you know, identifying different species of mosquitoes. And what that means is that there is a real beginning point for the study of mosquitoes that is within the realm in which people were leaving records. And the blessing was no one had ever written a history of this stuff. Interesting. And I had 20 odd miles from where I am this laboratory in which the documents, and in the old days, professors would send off prints of their articles. And there was this professor, there was this great fellow named Willard King, who was born in Virginia City, out in Montana, who at the turn of the 20th century, and the guy lived to be in his 90s, he was the, and Willard King was the head of the laboratory, the USDA laboratory in Orlando, that in 1942 received a shipment of this thing they called Gesserol, which we now call by its initials DDT, were the first tests. And then I found the people that were involved in those first tests, where the first tests were done against mosquitoes, was in Cocoa Beach. And D D DDT, I, is, that this, is that what we also called like DEET? Like the thing you find? No, no, no. Well, that's another thing that was developed out of this laboratory. DEET, oh, okay. which is, is a, a repellent. This laboratory was a quasi, you know, secret laboratory because it was looking at toxicants, insecticides, because of the allied forces were going to be in areas that were, you know, replete with mosquito-borne diseases, malaria, yellow fever, dengue, right. but they also wanted repellents. And the problem with repellents is some of the early repellents smelt, and that meant that our enemies could smell us before. Oh, no. So DEET emerges about in the early 1950s, uh, again here in Florida. So, and I knew that, I'm, I mean, I sat with the people who devised DEET, or, or the people, the first mosquito uh, insecticide uh, that used the kind of spray that too was developed uh, in Beltville, I believe in Maryland and down here in Florida and started out. And now when you have spray for Pam on your frying pan, all of that technology comes out of the study of insects and control. So I, I, I found this just trove of material and um, I have had the, you know, the wonderful experience of these uh, scientists and um, technologists have been very open and shared with me access to 
um, their papers, and that's allowed me to, to pursue an interest in which, as you said, your wife has a loathing of mosquitoes. Yes. Show me an individual that doesn't have a mosquito story, and I'll show you someone who has lived in Antarctica. Uh, that's about the only continent on this planet that doesn't have mosquitoes. They're everywhere. You folks in Maine, where you come from, you produce broods of mosquitoes in the summer, which are fearsome. They're, they're, uh, they're big. I've yeah. seen them. Yeah. yeah. But luckily we have an influx of tourists to feed them well. You know, yeah. come to Maine and bleed. Uh, I'm sure that will uh, attract many people. And uh, as a John, to answer your question, D is the thing we still use. DDT is the one that was harming the bird eggs. That's right. And, so and, and, you, know, and you have, I don't want to shock you, but you have some DDT in you right now because it uh, accumulates in fatty tissue. What the re, uh, and I, Rachel Carson is one of my heroes. I've, I've written about her. Uh, uh, her work is fascinating. Uh, it's a, it's a, if we had kept DDT for public health purposes, We'd still be using it. But what happened after World War II is we began to spray everything with it because it's such a power. But here's where science should have. In the, and in fact, uh, the scientist and entomologist pointed this out. If you kill 99.7% of the beetles that are eating potatoes or the mosquitoes that are pests, that 0.3% of uh, develop resistance hmm. and a single mosquito can theoretically over three or four generations produce about 141 million descendants which means that resistance by by the early 1950s ddt was no longer effective as uh, oh. a mosquito and it, it what happens with ddt is we metabolize it in our liver uh uh, uh bonds calcium uh, to it and and it doesn't affect the mammal ah birds they produce eggs eggshells calcium oh and the consequence was that they leached it out but the egg shells became fragile and more fragile and populations of birds began to plummet and you know it, it opens up you know what really i mean to me we all need to think about our household. And of course, yes. ecology is the study of our household and how we act. I mean, you, 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 can, um, you can go around your household uh, with a hammer trying to kill cockroaches and things, and you'll do a lot of damage, and you may actually uh, kill a cockroach. But the way in which you go after the cockroach uh, is one which has to look at your habitat and you. So enough said. I don't study cockroaches. I only study mosquitoes. Well, kind of another question that I had was, and I don't know the best way to phrase this, but like, what what is the end game for all of this effort that's gone into mosquito control? You know, for all of our efforts, there's still a lot of mosquitoes out there, and there's still diseases being spread. Is there more that is desired to be done? Regarding mosquito control, well, I or think is it that, kind of just okay the way it is. I really think it. I mean, to me, mosquito control really raises some fundamental existential questions. Right. What I hear in you is that is is on one end is this idea of eradication. You right. Know, no more mosquitoes. And and on the other is another e word education. Mm -hmm. There are somewhere over 3,500 different species of mosquitoes. And probably somewhere between 20 and 40 of those species are interested in a, a blood meal from you uh, and have the potential uh, to vector a virus or a plasmodium in the case of malaria. And one of the things that I think is essential is to educate people about the world they live in uh, and that we can live with a lot of those mosquitoes. They're not going to bother us. We need to look very closely at some 
species, particularly one called Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, that are very competent vectors of flaviviruses like yellow fever and dengue and West Nile uh, and Zika. Uh, and these mosquitoes, we know a lot, we know more about. You know, they don't fly very far. They are called domestic mosquitoes. They live in gutters and receptacles that we leave out. And if you educate the public to walk around their house and turn those things over, you'll really, when Zika broke out, uh, there's no silver bullet for any problem involving our species. When Zika broke out in Northeast Brazil, there was a town which had, was the epicenter. And, and, and the, the town had the, 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 the poorer sections were up on the sides of the mountain. And the, the Pan American uh, Health Organization did surveys there. And they found in these poor people's homes, these five gallon receptacles where the women would go down the hill and get water and bring it back up. And the actual mosquitoes were breeding in this. And so the Brazilian government correctly, you know, was spraying and trying. But the problem of the illnesses that were coming there, you know, we needed portable water so that the women didn't have to go down the hill to get the water. We needed screens. We, you know, many of these mosquito problems that produce dengue outbreaks are poverty questions. And so, yeah. Another thing I think is worth pointing out too with the, so in our environmental history class, we talked about mosquitoes for a month. And so now I can ruin a party too by talking about mosquitoes uh, whenever I go. <laughs> but, I imagine but, people just come up close to you and say, tell us more. <laughs> <laughs> but some things I remember is only females will take blood, blood from you. Yeah. They only want it once. But one of the things I found interesting was when I moved to Florida, I noticed that every pond had a fountain. And I thought that's because Florida had a vanity problem and everybody thought a fountain was cool. But there was this one pond near our dorm that it had a fountain, but it wasn't like a, a pretty fountain. It was just spurting water out the side. And that's when I learned about stagnant water and how you just you can't have stagnant water and all the ponds in Florida have to be aerated somehow or just moving. That's why they have fountains? And yes. Part of the reason, you know, it's I, I don't want, you know, I'm sure that there are listeners to these podcasts that have great sympathy for mosquitoes. And, and, and it's hard to be a mosquito because a mosquito goes through four instars in its larval phase and then it enters, it becomes a, it pupates and then it emerges. And when it emerges, there is a period of time in which it stands literally on the water before its wings dry and it can take flight. And if it's a windy day or if there are ripples in the water, the emergent mosquito drowns. Oh, the poor mosquito. Hey. <laughs> Such a shame. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I see already some potential in you. I mean, you know, you're identifying with mosquito. You know, you're. you're you're thinking like a bug, uh, and 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 that's a compliment in some places, I suppose. Yes. But yeah, I mean, it's 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 hard for them, and so having a fountain, it's, it's it's not a bad idea. I tell you what is another good idea is Gambusia finis, we a little predaceous minnow that's all over the place here in Florida, uh, and you know they eat, they'll clear. A pond of water, and that's why you don't see very. I'm, I've never been troubled by mosquitoes in the botanical garden because if you look at the these, I, mean, I collect them and bring. I have a little pond in our backyard, and I go to the botanical garden and get myself some Gambusia finis. But again, there's no silver bullet. Those Gambusia finis were discovered in the 1890s. The predaceousness, and so people began to take these Gambusia finis, and they they took them to California. And introduced them up uh, a guy named uh, 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 Stanley Freeborn, who went, went on to become the chancellor of UC Davis in the 50s and uh, early, I got until 1960. 
introduced them in Oroville, up near uh, Redding, and all around the state. And then took them up to Oregon. I took them to Hawaii. Took them to, well, now, wait a moment. There's something we didn't think about, and that's called invasive species. These are very predaceous fish. What are they going to eat if they don't have mosquito larvae? Well, and so, you know, once again, in this web of life, uh, we have to think about no how we do things. And yeah. in, today, you'll go to jail if you yeah. introduce, or you could, or get a fine, uh, if you introduce an invasive species species yeah. and that's why usda when you fly into hawaii will or the states if you're coming from abroad you know drop your apple drop your banana in the bin mm. because you may bring with it something that will just devastate because there's no you know natural predator for that and so uh, if anything as i said uh, we should have as a requirement not just a civilization course but an ecology course in which the consequences of simple acts uh, are are weighed. I mean, for me, uh, I, I as I say, I learn a great deal uh, by by looking at something. I just we just launched a butterfly garden in our backyard, and we're going to there's going to be a, 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 a we I found, I'm funding a butterfly garden on campus, and I, I've proposed the idea, and I and they think I'm whimsical, but I mean this. I would like Florida Tech to become known as a, a pollinating campus, mm. uh, that we are, you know, pollinators and yeah. that we have recognized that this is something that we can do not only in a garden, but engineers are pollinators, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that you go and you shape, Interesting. And you, you make this was engineering is not about doing the impossible. It's about looking at the materials, the problem at hand, the time frame, and then coming up with a solution. And that's a pollinating act. So, uh, um, that's interesting. And it butterflies be might by... be our metaphor. Yes, yeah. exactly. Oh, brilliant. And, and setting up a pollinator garden is not that hard. I, I, well, I've noticed, so working for the Department of Transportation in Maine, there's areas where there's pollinators on the side of the road where they just don't mow. And they put up a sign, it's, we didn't forget to mow, we're just leaving this for the pollinators. Intentional. And, yeah. uh, you know, if if a Department of Transportation can do it, you know, James, anyone someone... can do it. In some ways, we're pollinating over here. You know, we're taking information and we're just letting all the bees go and run with it as part of this podcast. Absolutely. So this, our logo could be a, a honeybee or something. There we go. It's fantastic. Um, yeah. See, I, I, you, you know, you started out feeling sorry for mosquitoes. See where it's going? Yeah. You, know, <laughs> so, you know, all you totally need to changed. do is when you go to bed tonight, start yes. buzzing and making little mosquito kind of yes. noise. And, you know, you're on your way. You're taking flight. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll go through those four stages. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, Dr. Patterson, there's one question that we have to get in. I know we're running low on time, but it's it's kind of a rite of passage for anyone who comes onto the show. We have to ask you the most critical question of them all, um, which is what is your favorite pizza topping? Uh, you know, I don't eat a lot of pizza. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're the first person to say that. <laughs> No, I, I don't. I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much a vegetarian. Really? Uh, so well, pizza is vegetarian. Yeah, I know. I, but when we do, my wife, my wife is a carnivore. I mean, she'll eat anything, yeah. uh, and, and uh, omnivore, I should say. Um, I suppose mushrooms. I like mushrooms. I like. I mean, I mean anybody that likes mosquitoes likes funguses. Uh, I mean, it, 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 it seems seems natural. Um, so yeah, I, I, I like portobello mushrooms, and I've never had a pizza that had portobello mushrooms on it. And that that that, that I might try. You gotta get the the baby bellas, the, the little portobellas. Yeah, yeah, that go yeah. well on the on the pizza. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Now, now I I I have, I like to think about that. I, I just I don't I don't think mushrooms I'm, is a fine answer, by the way, and, and well, a more common I mean, answer than you might think. A lot of people I don't know what it is about mushrooms, but they I like they red, won't eat them in a salad, but they'll put them on a pizza. 
No, I, I must say, when I walk through the backyard and we have a lot of mushrooms, I, I don't just idly reach down and pick one up and chew no. on it. Uh, well, that's um, fair. That, that, <laughs> that, 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 that might just end this promising career. Uh, you know, I'm at the point where no longer people say to you, you've got potential. I mean, this is it. <laughs> this, is, this is a full show. Uh, and uh, that's, that's all we can do. Dr. Patterson, thank you so, so much for joining us. This is pleasure. Incredible. My pleasure. And you guys are out there doing good work. That that is heartening to me. I, I, I've really been blessed by having had so many wonderful students, uh, and and the opportunity. You know, I, I, I think about them in. It, it cheers me to, you know, I, I sometimes imagine that if I'm not in front of somebody, I just disappear. But it, occasionally I get this, that somebody may actually remember me. And that, that is a wonderful feeling. And, and it becomes even more wonderful when I think maybe they remember something useful that I did. Uh, and that then makes me think about trying to do better. And one of the challenges I was telling my wife last night is this is a fault uh, that I and my wife share is you tend to think I tend to worry more about the, the, the students who say this is the worst professor I ever had than the great number of students who have been so kind to me and, and that. But that may be part of the process. You always want to reach out to the one that has their arms crossed and mm. says, will that be on the midterm? Uh, and, you know, you just say, I know your grade point's important, but life is much more consequential uh, than, um, you know, the 88% that you scored in this class or the 67% or I mean, those, those are numbers. He said, what did you learn? And was it useful for you? Now, the other thing I write on the board, besides I make, I write four things. All my classes for the last at least 30 years. First from Hippocrates, a reluctant student renders every effort vain. I'm a reluctant well, student. If, 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 if you come into any situation with your eyes fixed upon the notion, I don't like this. This is going to be bad. I don't want to do it. There's nothing I can do. Nothing I can do. The second is from Aristotle. All knowledge begins in wonder. That just, mm. you know, you see water. Galileo saw water coming off the side of a building and noted that it starts out as what seems to be a mass and then separates out, and he wondered why. And then begins doing experiments with inclined planes, measuring the... And then, 400 years later, an astronaut stands on the moon and drops a wrench and a feather and mm. says, Galileo was right. All knowledge begins mm. in wonder. And then the third and the fourth things are, I, I make mistakes. I mean, that's what we all do. But then at the end, I say, I want you to succeed. And that mm. that I, I, I truly do want my students to succeed. And in my own notion, and I've said this to colleagues, I, I have a pretty good detector of what I think are poor professors. And it's the ones that begin talking as if they are looking for the mistakes their students will make. Mm. You know, will they plagiarize? Will they cheat? You know, and and I don't, I'm not interested in that. I want them to succeed. And if someone does crib an answer, I will point it out to them, not in anger, but in disappointment, and then try to suggest you need to think inside. Would you want to ride on an airplane that is piloted by a woman or a man who cheated on their test? Would you want to go to a physician who took your blood pressure and said everything's fine when it wasn't fine? 
Hmm. And that's what, what one of the things we're teaching is integrity that you, you know, and you tell people when you don't know. And you, when you make a mistake, you acknowledge the mistake and then seek to correct it. That's, that's what this wonderful enterprise that you and I and I are involved in. We are learners. That's, that's what a homo sapien should be. We, we appreciate talking to you, Dr. Patterson. That's, uh, well, you know, yeah. it, it, I it's, enjoy talking to you guys, too. The voices yeah. inside my head are, you know, oftentimes dull, but your voices are better. You know, it's just you're reminding me of something. James and I were talking about this, that and you started off by saying, well, you know, technical person, call you a technical person or not. The fact remains that part of what you just said reminds me that you are some of the heart and soul of FIT, even though you're not, a, I'd say, in the, hist- the, in the physics department or that engineering school. Um, so thank you for that. Well, you lads are out there. You know, keep the faith and confusion to the enemy. <laughs>